Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, thank you for stopping talking. We're uh, going to have a, a hopefully a, a vigorous discussion. As you know, the subjects that we've dealt with this, both in the poster session and in the talks are not terribly controversial, but they are really deep questions because we're all trying to do things together and uh, we oftentimes don't have the same language or the same interpretation of what, you know, what's going on and so on. So the only way we can actually deal with a situation like that is to, uh, to have a vigorous discussion and sort of surface things that, uh, that bear further inquiry and further uh, analysis. So I've asked the, um, the speakers from earlier today to start by giving one or two minute uh, assessment of what they think is an important thing to, to measure. Uh, I won't ask them to tell you what they think it means, but Let's start by saying, well, what among the many different things that have, uh, have been, you know, technologies and uh, efforts going from surveys and observation all the way to measuring what is, uh, you know, with independent component analysis where your brain is firing or doing things. You know, there's a big range there. And one could say, well, we have to use all the tools. But let's start by by um, getting an idea of what, you know, what each of the four speakers thinks. And uh, then we'll open it to um, your questions. So be thinking about questions. And when you ask a question, you have to do it with a microphone because we're trying to record all of this for posterity and for you to tell your mother and father, you know, here I am talking, asking a big question. Uh, anyway, so there is uh, a person who I can't see, uh, and there's a person over there. So raise your hand, and um, I'll point, and you run. <laughs> All right. Zachariah. What I think is the most important to measure? Well, Let's well, start with that. Yeah. Um, I think it's an interesting question, but uh, as, as I just said, I think it really depends on what is the question. And as any good science, I think you should start with a good question. Um, so one place one could start uh, is trying to, uh, at least in my case, I'm trying to understand the architectural experience. Um, and I attribute a lot of that to cognitive neuroscience. So in my opinion, um, there's many ways of measuring neuroscience, I think. Um, we will see, I guess, a lot of examples also of measuring physiological measures uh, that correlates with uh, neural activity. Um, but in my opinion, uh, one way to, uh, to understand the architecture experience is to do uh, cortical measures um, and try to systematically vary, vary the architecture and see if you can find any correlations with that, depending on, of course, a hypothesis. I think that's the most important thing is to always develop a firm hypothesis and always have a deductive approach to any uh, architectural investigations. So for me, I would say cortical uh, uh, potentials and cognitive functions. Interesting how he goes to what he does. <laughs> Surprise. So. Did you expect something different? That's what we all do. In fact, one of the problems with scientists is that we learn a technique and then we keep doing it and keep doing it and find other questions to use that technique. But I, I think what Zacharias is uh, saying is something we, we all, I think we all have to agree on, which is you have to define the question very well. If you define the question very well, then you can start figuring out how to answer uh, or how to explore it. Giovanni. Yeah, I think that... Uh, um, Bring the uh, mic closer to you, please. Okay. And I think that behind um, all the um, neurophysiological measures that we can uh, 
acquire, it is more, mm, uh, very important to try to measure the engagement of the subject. Because if we analyze uh, a questionnaire or uh, uh, some neurophysiological or uh, behavioral measure, it is very important mm, uh, to understand if that measure is reliable or not. So that measure is reliable, reliable if the subject is really engaged in what is doing. So um, uh, thinking about an experiment, we know that it is uh, um, very important to uh, accommodate the subject to, to explain uh, the, the, the paradigm, the, the task very well. And um, in that case, uh, we can, uh, let's say, trust that uh, uh, the subject is um, really doing well uh, the job and uh, uh, so the, the important thing is to keep the attention of the subject mm. focused on the, his task and to um, uh, engage him uh, in what uh, we are uh, asking to do. And um, sometimes it's easy, sometimes not. So maybe I think th this is an aspect that uh, uh, it is important for uh, any kind of research. Can I add something to that? Sure. I think it's a really good point, and I think it's a really important point. And we also were trying to like deliberately find a way of uh, always having the subject uh, subject attention to to uh, having to do with affordances. Um, but in many ways, I still uh, I still think that um, it might not always be necessary because finding some correlations that does not uh, require any attention or intention is also really interesting. So, for instance, the, the question of affordances would be uh, we should be able to see differences in the affordances um, constantly, even without any intention to move. And if you find this kind of uh, differences, I think that's uh, equally important. But I think it's very obvious that you have to somehow create a goal each time for, for the participant. And addressing that kind of, uh, of issues in, in uh, investigating architecture can be really, really difficult. Um, so, but, but one way uh, I would say is to create some kind of goal, usually an action-oriented goal, that would usually keep some kind of subject uh, running into the same attention. Well, I would beg to differ, but I, I will let the audience ask the questions. Um, but I don't think Giovanni was talking about things that are intentional versus not intentional. I mean, what you want is a response, and the response could be an autonomic response. That mm. It's not a conscious response, but, but it shows that you're engaged. Right. Uh, well, David is frowning, so he must have a good idea. So uh, it, it's an impossible question, of course. <laughs> and um, so I, I will retreat to what I like best, the kitchen. So, um, uh, how would you evaluate, or what should you consider when trying to understand somebody in the kitchen? And you could say, well, let's see what tasks they have to perform. I spent a lot of my life thinking about uh, task environments and, and, and how one goes about doing it and defining metrics on the space. But um, what I appreciated soon was that there are so many tasks that one is performing there in the kitchen that you can't really look to the design of the kitchen. The kitchen is ill-designed if it is optimized for um, a small set of tasks. It has to be optimized for many sets of tasks. And so um, you have this problem if you maintain the perspective that we evaluate things on the basis of the relation to performance on a task. So you say, well, I'll relax it. It won't just be a task, it'll be something else. They're kicking back, whatever that might mean. And so they're not actually engaged in a task. They're enjoying themselves. Something's happening, and the environment matters to them, but it doesn't matter to them in an affordance-like manner. So one word about affordance, just to say, if you're a smoker, you see ashtrays 
everywhere. If you're not a smoker, you don't see ashtrays in the places that they see ashtrays. So affordances are not usually tied so well to goals because they're tied to behavioral repertoires. But if you um, invite consideration of the, the manifold set of tasks, then um, affordances, it's a difficult system to use. And a lot of things are like that. So when you say, what should you measure? The scientists can only say with respect to a well-defined task or some set of some activity upon over which the, a metric can be assigned. This is better, this is worse, this is good for that, it's not good for that, so it's always instrumental. But even if it's enjoyment, then you make a task out of enjoyment and you say better or not for enjoyment. But I think this is, um, there is something wanting in that whole approach to analysis, tying it down to the instrumentally good nature of something that um, architects do try to get away from. You know. Okay, I'm sure you'll have uh, things to say about that, Upali. <laughs> After he made my head spin, <laughs> thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna take an overly simplistic approach to that, that from my lens of the world, coming from the architecture side, uh, I think the most critical thing for us is uh, um, to be able to have a measure of our space. We don't have that. We, we have not developed a vocabulary beyond proportions and uh, scale. Like, we don't know how to talk about it. Like, when you were talking about transitions, how do I talk about transitions? How do I talk about integration? So space syntax has tried to do that, but there are very few tools that in the world when we look, whether it's an affordance or a, or a spatial quality or an experiential quality, even if I know the outcome, I cannot correlate it back to place because I don't know how to measure place. Um, so if simplistically, if our world is around patterns of place and patterns of behavior, however you measure behavior and however you measure place, those can only correlate if they are both have sophistication in those measures. And I think on the place side, we are lacking in how we can do that. And to me, that would be a priority that for me to be able to talk to a neuroscientist, I should in some way be able to measure a spatial quality or an experiential quality and what that might look like. So can I ask a question? Yes. So, so I, I, I'm not profoundly confused about my position, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I, am, I am I'm quite confused. Uh, I, I'm moderately confused about my place. Mm -hmm. So not my social place, but um, you know the concept of place, mm -hmm. right? It's got all that overtones of of. Um, what it is and where you are in a much uh, broader sense of, is that the place you're talking about? Yes, so, I th and that's kind of why I use place instead of space. So space is easier to analyze and it's two dimensional and you can get some quantitative things. You can put a sensory layer to it and you can get environmental measures. Uh, experiential measures of space are just very difficult because they're dependent on the human and there's an there's an interaction measure that there's some qualities that only happen when a human interacts in place, and we don't know what those are yet. But I used place instead of space because we design places, but we only know how to measure spaces as and, an industry. And yet we say, put him in his place. Yeah. <laughs> that mean, that, I mean, you're gonna assume that we know what we're talking about, right? So your place is somehow or other defined by you. We don't know how, but... Yeah, but you know, like home, right. the office, yeah. uh, the cafeteria, there's all these categorization that happens, and the there's a phenomenology typical of those places, but... Uh... But those I would call typologies. Okay, but they, they're a step toward the place notion. Right. What do you want in addition? So the play, and, and I would love for the audience to actually uh, yeah. chip Save into us. that because I know there's Ifu Tuan's work and there's a lot of work around place theory that's trying to get to the manifest of space that is more experiential but has never e ever been quantified in terms. So I'm not equipped to say, that's why I said, he said what needs to be measured, I said that because if we are not able to define something, 
we are not close to measuring it in some ways, but I am talking about the idea that uh, where I am right now, I am in a place. That place is defined by the spatial parameters, by the sensory parameters, by the human beings who are within that, but there's something more than the architecture, but a lot of architectural parameters that come together to make it place. So that's kind of a broader definition, but I have someone willing to help me out here. I hope that's an answer and not a question. <laughs> so maybe the question isn't what but where we measure. I mean, in many ways, our problem is symptomatic of the problem that we're all going to face in the sciences as well as in many other disciplines uh, in terms of how we use the information we're getting about the world. Mm -hmm. So we've moved beyond mechanistic science, right? The 20th century is really system science. Excellent. One of the things we haven't really addressed is deductive and inductive reasoning don't really work quite as well when you're dealing with massive amounts of data, asking complex questions that are interactions of systems upon systems. So one of the problems we have, and we're symptomatic of this, is that space, and Helmholtz does a very good job actually arguing with Kant about the definition of space in 1863. There's good history here. This is not an old, a new problem. It's in fact a very, very old problem. Wilhelm Wundt had the same problem with the difference between psychology and anthropology. Where are you looking, not what? Right, so you've got an individual and you've got all the things that pertain to an individual. In other words, I've got sensory perceptions that I'm getting. Space, as we understand, really doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, there is right. no good definition for it. Place, which is culturally determinative, tends to happen at larger scales anthropologically and sociologically. And we haven't been able to do very good assessments of those mm -hmm. that deal with the specifics then of how an individual interacts with a thing which is really what we're looking at. So we're all over the map. And this, I think, is the real challenge. And modern neuroscience with fMRI and everything that it's doing still can't answer exactly what's causal between what you're measuring and what you're doing. I mean, you say, let's look at aesthetics, and then I show you something that I've already decided has an aesthetic property. Oh, sure. wow, that sounds like the snake biting the snake's tail. I mean, this is the problem we're facing. So it's the where that might be the question and not the what, and the how. And I don't necessarily think it's a question of instrumentation, but really rethinking what we're looking at fundamentally. So uh, let me just make a statement and then we have a question over there. Um, it seems to me uh, as a scientist, a neuroscientist, that we often learn a lot by studying uh, natural, you know, experiments, because we don't do experiments with humans most of the time. And so one experiment that relates in particular to the sense of space is uh, getting Alzheimer's. You lose the sense of space. You lose your relationship to space. You cannot, you know, as you advance, you don't know where you are. But worse than that, you don't have a way of projecting what's beyond what you can see. Okay, so that, that is a way of thinking about space. Space is that which we can capture, not necessarily where, but in this case, what? What is it about space that gives us a sense of identity and uh, identification and you know, orientation, location, that's space, right? And I think to some extent, it's that kind of space that the architect is concerned with. Anyway, sorry, I just wanted to say something. All right, a question up there. <laughs> it's kind of a segue. Um, I thought it was interesting that no one on this panel, um, even though there was discussion of behavior, no one on this panel talked about outcomes because in the past um, presentations, at this conference in particular, um, and in related discussions, have tried to find ways to measure outcomes. Either um, people get healthy or faster, or kids learn more, more quickly or more effectively, or retain things for longer. A lot of discussion about learning and um, how that works. And so, um, I, it's not a. It's interesting that this panel doesn't 
didn't go there. And also it's interesting that that seemed like it was almost a bridge. The, the conversation is getting in a way more sophisticated and more nuanced um, because the idea of bridging the line between looking at things that are you know, cortic cortically measured and then looking at behavior are starting to come together. And um, it's just interesting to me that there wasn't in this a discussion of outcomes because those tend to not be something that people are aware of. They're studied in this sort of other um, kind of third, third person testing situation to say this is the place that people spent time in. There was daylight or there wasn't or there was flexibility or there wasn't and these were the outcomes. Um, so I just thought that was an interesting space that wasn't covered. Well, I, I think we'll build towards that over the next day or two, by the time we have some outcome to think about. But in addition, I, I just wanted to point out that Giovanni's experiments, the outcome there was what, what did the people say? Were they comfortable? Were they happy? Were they, that is the outcome, right? And what they were trying to do is correlate a particular type of space uh, and the measurements that were being made to those outcomes. I mean, outcome is not necessarily a physical behavior, it's just how you feel, right? Or anyway, yeah, you know I, what I'm saying. I would add to that because I think in, in some of the things we shared, it, the outcome was sense of achievement, for example, or reduced anxiety. That's a very specific outcome. Um, if you look at outcomes that you can tie to the business case, which is kind of where you're going. Um, in that particular study, we actually did measure um, student uh, learning outcomes and whether their test taking improved. But the intervention was not big enough to have an impact on that. So I actually deliberately didn't share those results uh, because we make leaps yeah, in being able to say, and I know a colleague of mine will be talking tomorrow about a study linking uh, design to physical health, for example. Uh, but I do want to go back to what Eduardo said, that outcomes is what happens because of what you did. That's an outcome. But we do have a bias in the kind of outcomes we want to see, and in reality as a profession, we want to see outcomes that justify what we did. And, and that's just something we have to be very cognizant of. That I just, I, I am brilliant, I did this. If you can just make me look good, it would be awesome. <laughs> well, scientists are not that different. <laughs> we, we claim to be extremely objective, but we have pride and things like that, you know. Yeah. Uh, any you other questions? Right here. Okay, question. Is this on? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. A lot of this uh, discussion reminds me of the famous observation by I, the granddaddy of environmental psychology, Kurt Levine, and I think it was he who once said, nothing is so useful as a good theory, because the good theory is what tells you what you should be looking at, and uh, that tells you what you should be measuring. Now, myself, having been working with between psychology and architecture since the mid-1970s, the theory that I've used all that time is called perceptual control theory. And in perceptual control theory, affordances are not a property of the environment, they're not a property of the person, they're a property of the control loop. And control systems control what they sense, and so if you want affordances, say, that are kicking back, you say, I want to kick back in a kitchen. We say, well, what are the, con what, what, what are the control variables that, have, that must be controlled you know, in, the, in the situation? Well, uh, I could start listing them off. One, in that case, uh, kitchen preparation and work is part performance arc, so it's got to be observed and observable. And this means who's doing it, what's their access to it from the kitchen. It means probably if you're preparing food, you're going to move that toward the people who are looking, not away from the people who are looking. It also means the flattery index and lighting is important because you want to look good while you're performing food preparation. It also got to do with the legibility index and speech that we have in human factors. I can go through a whole list of measures that you could take. Say, hey, if you want to have kicking back in your kitchen 
as an objective, verifiable, measurable uh, uh, property that you could do. We could do it for you. We can identify it, we can operationally define it, and we can do it for you. But all of that comes out of having a good theory. Now, maybe it's the wrong theory. Maybe somebody else wants to design a kitchen uh, using Jungian archetypes. That's okay. You know, do it. See what it comes up with. Uh, I'm willing to bet a lot of the times we'll come up with a lot of the same things, maybe some different things, which will make it a better kitchen overall. But that's, that's my sort of two cents right now, is that I come down being much more of a Galilean about these things than a Baconian, you know, and the old argument about the science, whether you just go from data up or theory down. I think here is where you need some good theories. Okay. If I may or reply, hypotheses. Can I yep. make yeah, sure. So um, that strikes me as an articulate characterization of some of the perspective of the task approach, um, because you have to define the context of activity and what the objectives of activity are. Here's what it leaves out the felt quality of experience. So if you were an experienced designer, you're not doing that practical thing. So for me, one of the best experiences is a, a, a razor sharp knife and a tomato. And you put the tomato here and you run the knife there and then the tomato didn't know and then it fell apart. <laughs> There, is, there are few things more deliriously happy than that. And now you say, <laughs> so uh, you say, well, do you cut better? I say, no, you know, uh, I have this Japanese knife. It cuts the same speed, but it gives me that experience. This other knife, it cuts very well. It is indistinguishable, really. So it's not in the, the uh, objective parameters that have to do with that. We, we might be able to discover why it is I get that thrill um, in, when that happens. Maybe it's the way the tomato falls apart. Maybe it's something else. So we might be able to find it. But it really hasn't got to do with the pragmatics of it. And it's not just the control loop. Because both with respect to the parameters we care about, if you care about instrumentality, are identical. It's this other thing, the felt quality of it. Now people are always trying to find some things that make the felt quality of something better. I know that there was some neuroscience that determined the speed with which you should run your hand over the, the arm in order to have a lovely feeling. If you go too fast, it's not as good. You go too slow, it's not as good. There's a just so. So you can find some of that, and you know it's better. Now, so I think there is other stuff beyond the task. Because you put it so cleanly, I'm able to say what it was that I have against task analysis. Uh, that's, that's a certain type of praise, as we say. I was, ev everything, <laughs> yes, ev so everything, you, everything you've said I agree with. And I could say uh, the you know, part of that experience, you're, you're controlling things in the experience. You're, you're controlling lots of aspects in the environment and the knife. And I would say, gee, a lot of those smaller se selections of the knife, that's not an architectural choice. But maybe it is an architectural choice if you want to display that Japanese knife you know, in, in view of the, of the people in the, in the place observing your performance. And by the way, speaking of Japanese knives, the Japanese have a wonderful scientific system together on feeling of texture over cloth as one draws their hand, and they've got that measured down to a real fine science. So, I mean, those sorts of things can be uh, operationally defined, brought down, enhanced, and I, I don't think you're losing anything. In fact, the more you describe that, uh, the better it gets. So I'm with you there. <laughs> Questions? All right, we have one back there. Yeah, um, I'm kind of curious. I mean, I'll, I'll preface this with saying that I'm doing my, my PhD in neuroscience looking at how people experience space. And for my experiments, I run like hundreds, maybe a hundred or so participants. And I occasionally wonder if we lose the effect um, in the average, um, and if we should be looking at case studies or looking more at individual differences. Um, 
you know, this is just more of like a, uh, I'm kind of blathering on here, but, you know, do, does someone's uh, experience of place influence the, the things that we measure as a response to space? Like, I, 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 I occasionally wonder if we lose the effects by looking at these like large samples and um, from, a, from a practical perspective for architects, like, are we, do we think that people universally respond to space the same way or do they, do they not? And if so, do we just design for the extremes? of uh, you know, people with different sensory experiences, people with Alzheimer's. Does that make sense? This is my question. Makes sense? <laughs> um, it, the question makes sense. I'm not sure there's an answer or an easy <laughs> answer, but maybe. Can, can I ask something yeah. to the question? Yes. I have a question for the question. Are you, are you asking whether uh, an experience, if, if we can somehow hold the same experience a couple of times. So when you have one, one participant in a study, and for instance, in my study, he did 240 trials. I don't think the 240th was the same as the first. I don't think that architecture ever is experienced the same way ever twice. So that doesn't really matter in my opinion. But we're trying to make, we're trying to inform design with, with neuroscience, and we're trying to make these general conclusions about how, you know, like, the aperture of a door would, would influence the way, the way that someone perceives it or if the, their approach or their avoidance to that. And, and so I'm just, do you know what I mean? Like, what are we doing? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this, that's not a question in, in I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, context always has an effect, though. If yeah. you, um, if there's a, a guillotine over here and it keeps coming down, I guarantee I'm going to titrate this space much more carefully than if there isn't one over there. So my, my subjective understanding of the space and the whole attitude I have to how fine I gradate the space, my, uh, I, I quantify the space, would surely depend on a lot of contextual matters. Now, if the guillotine is here, that's a different place than if the guillotine isn't coming up and down right over here. So I don't know what a place is, but I guess that that would, there, there's these contextual matters which has something to do with place, and everybody knows, as do you, that uh, context matters hugely. Um, if I can just add something. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, uh, so when, when, you, when you conduct these kinds of experiments, I think, uh, as it also has been previously mentioned, the theory and the hypothesis is really, really, really important, otherwise you're just doing an exploratory uh, research, which is kind of, I don't know, in architecture doesn't really make sense for me, not uh, when you cross it to uh, cognitive neuroscience. Um, so when, when you uh, I have to think how to really put this in a good example, because I, I see that a lot of architects, uh, I'm also educated architect, we really just want an answer, so really what can I use this for? Yeah. Well, I don't think that we are there yet, and as many people probably also know, I have a lot of unpopular opinions. I don't think we are going to be there at least not until 15, 20 years because we're still doing some very basic research, understanding how perception and action, for example, for example, action uh, and, and perception are related and how this in the end accumulates into some architecture experience because we don't know how this works. So how can we really make some conclusions? We're just making really small steps and I think that we somehow, I think all researchers in this field really uh, are doing the right thing by doing really small steps all the time. I, I think making two big conclusions might bias the whole field in the wrong direction. It's one of my unpopular opinions. So I think it, it's important to, I mean context obviously, but it's also important to know who the client is, right? So you you, you know, you, you intimated that, or you said actually that, are we looking for an average, or are we looking for the ends, and so on. And it, it, it depends, right? If you're, if you're designing uh, a prison, which we will discuss tomorrow, you know, there's a session on, uh, uh, on imprisonment, and you know, you're thinking, you have to think about the range of people who are going to be users, or a hospital, or whatever, some, some uh, facility, right? But if you're designing a kitchen for the person, and you have some idea of what design things are causing certain types of responses, like uh, 
interest or curiosity or whatever, uh, then you ask the, the user, which ones work for you? And if you have a VR system, you can put them up for that person to test and respond. So, you know, which, which you use, the average, the uh, statistically significant response or whatever is, I think, very important if you're thinking about a common usage facility. But that's not what you would do with one person or maybe a small number of people. There, there you have to do, you probably want to see how that person responds. And of course, any of these traces that we get from EEG or, or uh, other biometrics um, are noisy. We know they're noisy. And sometimes you have to look at 240 cases, hopefully not always that many, but um, if anyone publishes a paper in which they have one or two examples or tested two people, then uh, they can't make really general conclusions. They can raise issues, but anyway, uh, question, yeah. So uh, I want to go back to the subject of space and place that you were talking about, and that reminds me very much of the idea of uh, allocentric versus egocentric navigation uh, in the cognitive sciences, uh, which also goes through different cortical pathways. And the, the fact that you're pointing out uh, that we do not have a uh, good language yet for uh, for uh, the idea of place, which corresponds more to the egocentric navigation, uh, might imply that uh, as a field architecture is designing more allocentrically and uh, for getting the more uh, egocentric, uh, basically, uh, features of space, which might uh, have more acute effect on uh, people's uh, emotional response or uh, their navigation in a, in a space. So. Um, Perhaps that, uh, you know, uh, going further in that direction can actually inform uh, architecture as basically a discipline into things that it is neglecting. And also, uh, so because for instance, uh, you don't have a problem with plans of space, which are more allocentric, those are uh, in the design but other features are not required. So um, I'm thinking whether you see the generation of such language for more egocentric approach to environments can actually cause uh, a shift in the discipline from models into um, different types of design. Absolutely, and, and that's a great way of putting it. Um, I also want to go back to the systems thinking approach um, because there is something very interesting in our times that probably all the people here have at least 100 variations of theoretical models that they live within right now, just within our small group of people. So in an interdisciplinary field, we are constantly stumbling upon theories rather than come developing something or coming upon it uh, very intentionally. And, and it's an interesting time because I wonder if part of the problem is we're looking at architecture and neuroscience and neuroscience and architecture, if we step back and said, um, how do we create an ecosystem that promotes health? That's a big wicked question then. You take a big wicked problem and then architecture has certain things to offer, product design has certain things to offer, policy makers have certain things to offer. And in the real world, problems are often defined at a very interdependent level. Um, and that's, that's part of the challenge. So I think it would be very interesting. I think we are shifting towards that. The pre-post model is already old. We are moving towards a pre-predictive post model. Almost everybody is trying to predict. Everyone is trying to say, okay, if you do this, then I think this is gonna happen with big data, with data science. Like, it's a very interesting time that I, I really wonder because I, I think that would be a great thing to explore. I think the theoretical model, like the perceptual control theory, I hadn't thought about in ages, and that would be interesting. I can see all of those saying yes and. And my frame of reference usually is to take a real world problem and say, now how do I frame questions around it? And how do I investigate it? And who would I bring together under what theoretical parameters to look at it, which is 
which is very different. Uh, um, my husband is a bioinformatics professor, and I remember that moment when he said, yeah, well, we're not, we're not testing hypotheses anymore. We are generating hypotheses from the data. Right? There's a paradigm shift. Right? So when, when the paradigm is shifting so fundamentally, and especially in architecture and lived environments, every moment you're in space, you have changed the space you're in. Whatever I built, the user went in on day one and changed it. It's a constantly evolving thing. So I don't know if we have the language. I think it's a bigger question than my brain can really grapple with. But I do think sometimes it might be easier if we came together and weren't worried about uh, particularly the two fields and said, OK, what does architecture have to offer to the larger question of uh, mental health and Alzheimer's? That becomes sometimes an easier pathway for discovery. Well, that, that, that sets a limitation. Right. Which is what, what generally, if we want to answer <laughs> something, we have to delimit it. Yeah, I'd like to say something about allocentric and egocentric. So um, I was thinking about this uh, just uh, recently because if you're a, a neuroscientist, there's lots of ways of conceptualizing space, the, peri, uh, the peripersonal space or the peri-hand space or the peri-head space. All these are represented specially. And so we have lots of neural representations of space that are not the same as the big space that, that's being represented. But one thing that's interesting, I think, about architects is that, uh, this one's mine. So um, they- <laughs> You can have mine, David. Thank you. So I could represent this as an object-centered representation, which would be its dimensions and stuff, and I could characterize it in its position over this thing and, and see it in a geometric model. I, I, what I'm getting to is tools for people to use in architecture. Um, and I could, you know, look around it, spin it around, and so on. But the, the thing that is quite interesting, I think, about architects is that they're, they're very interested in each of the perspectives. So you have multiple, an in, indefinite number of, if you like, egocentric perspectives on it, as if you were here, this one here. So, so many perspectives. Now, you, you might want to do your analysis by doing some um, probabilities over the perspectives that people are going to assume and say, I'm going to design so that for the majority of people who are going to see, they're going to see it like this. They're not going to see it like that. They're not going to be looking down like that. I'm not designing the space to be looked down like that, even though, of course, my model shows it to me like that. <laughs> That's not the way I'm really designing it. I'm des so um, without saying anything more than that one little thought that is this, um, that, that the conception the architect has to have is of the multiple perspectives rather than the purely three-dimensional Cartesian allocentric perspective, I think that's a very interesting thing. We don't have to quantify that so much. In this case, what we need are good tools that facilitate the architect to work with those spaces to see what they want to see. And, and so I think tools are an important thing to bring in. We are talking about measurement all the time, but in fact, what we want a lot are tools that help us do better things for us. Not no measurements, just architecturally speaking, tools are, are, are changing fast and they're tremendous. Yes, I can't debate that can't one. Can't disagree so, with that. So, another question. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Hi. I've got a... Who's got the microphone? Raise your hand. Oh, there's one. Oh, okay. Quick and easy question. Um, so we talking about the, this uh, idea of task-oriented versus uh, kicking back, as we as was said. Uh, you know, obviously, space is understood through use, and it seems to me, you know, equally true that we don't we re, t kicking back is in itself a task, and and we're constantly understanding space through use. But at the same time. It doesn't seem true that when we are using space, when we are doing tasks, that we're thinking about the tasks. So from the point of view of cognitive research, um, are we still assuming that if we're measuring somebody doing a task, that they're thinking about the task? Um, or is, 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 because that seems to me to be, A, not true in, in reality, and B, it leads to just a lot of 
sort of weird neurochemical chemical ter terrorist ideas where we're trying to optimize. And optimization isn't, doesn't, isn't always the point of what people have been talking about today. Um, so, you know, it's a, sort of a amorphous question, but. Yeah, well, in the formalism, in the formalism, you, you define a task environment. So whether the person is fully aware of um, how the task structures the opportunities for action, the opportunities for action are being defined by their role in the task. So if it's a flat surface and you want to cut against it, the, that would be with respect, the value of the flat surface and its hardness would be measured with respect to the cutting. So you'd have a task environment, which is an abstract, fully abstract thing defined relative to a set of objectives. The thing is, there are dozens or hundreds of tasks so hundreds of task environment, and one person doesn't have to be engaged in one task even while they're still carrying it out. They could be thinking about something, they could be listening to the music and just chopping. So that, that's one thing that makes the task environment approach quite difficult because it gives um, contradictory values to what's good out there depending upon which task it is. If you're doing two tasks, they could be in contrast, they could be in conflict. So with respect to your question, you don't have to be thinking about the task in order, to use the, in order for somebody else to use the task formalism in order to be able to measure things such as the control perception approach. Um, and just assuming the task approach though isn't quite true to us. There's a lot of stuff going on that isn't, I think, just tasks. Even if we have multiple tasks to do, we have the other stuff that isn't best understood as engaged in a task. Yeah, I, I, thank you. I, I, it, I feel like it's uh, complicated by, we're getting in our own way frequently because we're uh, unable to understand the, um, the, the uses of a space uncomplicated by variables we introduce by observing, you know, it's the, uh, right. particular to this kind of research because it's so, predicated on the, the quote-unquote natural use of a space, um, which is uh, difficult to get in an experimental setting. Thank you for um, this time to speak with you. And I'm thinking as an architect, maybe I'm taking this a little too simplistic because I'm thinking specifically and hanging out with a bunch of neuroscientists and statisticians here lately, <laughs> that it comes down to a very, to me, a simple outcome of health. So I'm thinking about um, how the environment impacts the health of the individual in the space. So I'm constantly thinking about GSR, I'm thinking about blood pressure, I'm thinking about cortisol, I'm thinking about all those things. And with the proper independent variable and, and also controlling for the confounds, isn't it, to me it seems as, as simple as a, a designing the element in, having a baseline, designing the element, and then checking for those physical outcomes after a couple of weeks, after a couple of months. Doesn't that give us what we're looking for as architects and help us start define what those elements are that are causing the decreases in blood pressure, decreases in, in, in um, bad feelings, and increase in better health? And am, I, am I making this too simple or? I mean, I understand all the I understand all of the psychological things. I understand the culture, but when it comes down to humans and how they respond to environments, no matter where they're from, there's a general bell curve of how people respond in spaces. So help me help me understand that where where I'm missing it. Such a good question. <laughs> Everybody has an answer for that one. <laughs> Does anybody in the audience want to answer? <laughs> I mean, I can answer every question, but I don't want to. <laughs> However, uh, I, I think Terry can answer that question. So. so at the very first ANFA meeting that I went to, which was at the National Academy um, meeting house in Woods Hole, the, the subject was, what do we know about environments that will help health and help uh, people recover? And it turns out, this is very, very revealing, it turns out that there's a lot of work that's been done, a lot of outcomes, 
uh, on how fast someone recovers and how, how they feel. And, and uh, some, of the some of the really important variables was nature. Right. Being exposed to nature rather than being cooped up in a room with very little light is, is much, much more uh, conducive. Art is conducive. Uh, th there are some things that are really, really bad. The worst thing you can do is shut off daylight, and so you don't know what time of the day or night is. Of course, that's what we do with the independent ICU. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and, and even worse than that is uh, the, the fact that there are loud noises that come on in random intervals. That, that's, that's how you torture people. Uh, and finally, and this is something that is the, the most important factor in, in uh, your mental attitude toward uh, where you are and, and how you're going to react to it, if anybody can come into a room any time of the day and night and stick you with things and put things in you, and your brain realizes this and is always alert to find out what, you know, what's, what's coming next, it's a terrible, terrible way for, to have someone recover. So it turns out that our hospitals are ideally designed not to help people get well. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so if I can answer that, I would say that that's very true, and you're not being simplistic. But if you notice, in the last 20 years, with that approach, we only know about 10 things. We know about daylight, daylight's good. We know about nature, nature's good. We know going out in nature's good, we know viewing nature's good, we know certain things. And so what is missing is we could only get this far. There are certain things that are so big that we could do a confirmatory approach to it and we got to it. Once you get into the complexity of interdependent variables, because who was it? You were saying that trade-offs. You're making trade-offs all the time. And, you may, and I love the daylight example because I'm from healthcare. I've done a lot of those studies that show that, yes, there are improved outcomes. And uh, because that's such a compelling body of work, we now have windows in all the ICUs, which is fantastic. What we also did was now we oriented the bed to be parallel to the window so we can look it out. What that did was it reduced the 360-degree axis that clinical staff was having around the patient bed. But we didn't have an equally com compelling body of work that could analyze, was the daylight parameter more important than the clinical axis, and how do I get those two together? So I think part of where I'm saying is that is absolutely a clean approach, and it helps you anchor, and it gets you a certain way, but the real world is messy and there are interdependent variables, and we are at a time that we can at least start, we can tease out clean hypotheses, and we can test them. But we also have to embrace that when it comes back, we'll have messy variables and a lot of interdependencies, and we need to have some level of comfort of dealing with that as well. Um, and perhaps that's why you didn't hear so much about it, because we kind of took that as a given, that some of that is in place and we can do it, but what's next? Does that help? And why would you want it all the time like that anyway? Right. So people take coffee. People want a certain stimulation if they want to be creative. They go to nightclubs, I think, whatever they call them nowadays. <laughs> the uh, clubs, there's no night part. So they, they, go, they go doing things that purposely put them in, into the, the parameters which you were, were trying to minimize. They're maximizing some of those parameters. So, I mean, life is a lot richer than the kind of well, I, th I, think, I think we're talking uh, about a subset relatively small of the population of the Earth. I mean, there are people that it, it would be wonderful to give them nature, but they're in the middle of Mumbai. Right. Or they're in the middle of New York City with very tall buildings. Can we give them nature? Well, it costs money. It costs political, you know, political decisions. It's, it's a lot of, you know, we're trying to come up with solutions that are great for middle class and up, but may not be at all feasible for a large amount of the population of the world. And for them, we have to think about, you know, what can we do with the, our design that helps people under conditions that are not optimal. And, and when I brought up Alzheimer's, that is a condition that is not optimal. And the loss of a sense of space means that, you know, you're, you're unable to benefit from a lot of things that we think are good for you. 
Is nature good for a person who doesn't know where they are? I'm not sure, but it's hard to measure that. And there's an increasing number of people mm -hmm. who are under those conditions. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying we shouldn't think about the privileged and the ones who can afford a neuroscientist or an architect. Um, but I think, I think what, what we're trying to learn by learning how we respond to space is to think about all the different conditions under which we're trying to relate to space. And in order to do that, I think we need to do more experiments. We need to create conditions that are informative. Now, you know, there's a lot of work in urban planning trying to bring green spaces and so on. And, and there are some great cities that are, you know, they're ranked as to how green they are. Um, but there are many cities where that's just not going to happen. So is there something else we could be doing? Questions? Hi. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I don't even consider myself to be a brain test in what AMFA is doing. I'm trying um, to see with all these spotlights on the subject, and I still don't recognize the whole picture, which is um, uh, due to my background, which is in architecture. But I would like to see how is this going in terms of so I'll, I'll give an example. Back in the days when I was in school, we used to have this old book called Newford where we have all thing, things standardized. The desk heights, the kitchen uh, perfect sizes, and all that kind of standardized uh, uh, at the time where it was more commercial to have such standardized uh, things. But I realized during my uh, practice, practicing years that it the personal experience that makes the customer happy with the, the space, the outcome of the space. So the question is that, is it safe to measure, I see where AMFA is going, but is it safe to measure all these impacts on the brain from the built environment? Should we standardize how the environment should be, or is it something personal and it should be in contest with the uh, cultural aspects and the individual aspects and all that. So to put it simply, is it possible to standardize the effect of the environment on the brain, put it in, in kind of curriculum, or it's not happening soon, or is it difficult to do? I, I know it's, it's going everywhere, but can we actually standardize this kind of impacts that we're getting from the discoveries from uh, the neuroscience activities? Especially that what we can actually measure is only the, the cognitive uh, spots in the brain, not the experience itself. Interesting. Right, take a yeah, uh, it. yeah, I just, yep. uh, maybe it's not the perfect answer to this, but, um, as soon as it gets to culture and something that is more of quality, that is more delicate uh, and way more subjective, I think we are very far away from that. This is just an, another unpopular opinion of mine. Um, I think that we should start maybe with some of the autonomous reactions. And this is why I think that uh, neuroscience is a good way of understanding architecture experiences. Uh, I completely agree with you. Cognitive functions and cognitive reactions do not reflect experiences but they definitely give us an insight, and this is, this is what is interesting. Um, for instance, um, seeing that, uh, if you guys remember the results of my study, um, in the P200, we see a difference depending on the affordances, but we do not see a difference if you have a no-go. We do only see differences if you have a go. So whether you have to move or you do not have to move, the affordances are processed the same way but if you have to move, you're starting to act differently. And this is uh, independent of culture because we all act. And this is why, in my opinion, we should start with something that is way more basic if we want to do these hypotheses instead of doing inferences from culture. I think that's way more difficult. I really, uh, I, I, see, I think that people who do these kinds of studies are really brave. I think it's really nice. 
but I'm not that brief. Um, based on, I guess, your, your experiences, uh, do you have any thoughts on how architectural education has to change or education in neuroscience or psychology has to change so that architecture students understand some of the strengths but also the limitations of what it means to work with data and to have confidence or not have confidence in data and its limitations. And on the flip side with the, the scientists, the idea that you, to use the example of the perspectives, the way designers work by multiple perspectives, the idea that you work on something without a strictly systematic rational approach, but that when you get to the right answer, everybody can kind of feel and sense it's right. It's a, it's a different way of working. I, do you all have any thoughts on, on um, how each educational model is going to have to innovate or adapt to be able to teach students how to uh, work, work more uh, effectively, I suppose, with each other on this topic? How much time do we have at all? <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing even the audience has a lot of thoughts on that. 30, 37 seconds. <laughs> um, you want to respond? Well, as someone who was brought up at the architectural curriculum, I would say yes, yes, and yes. Uh, we, we don't have a base level comprehension. It's not part of our curriculum to understand that the decisions we make, even thinking about that every design decision is a hypothesis. That's what it really is. You know, you can test it, you can't test it, I don't know what the methods are, but you're making assumptions all the time when you put pen to paper. Uh, and that is not in our curriculum. I think psychology 101 should be core architectural curriculum. I think cognitive science 101 should be. If you're designing for people, you have to understand people. Then you start designing for typologies, you have to understand those typologies. So, um, yes, I, I think there's so much. And I would almost also argue that, uh, and everybody here in the audience will have thoughts on that as well, but there is also a huge need for professional education. We have to have more education for practitioners once they're in the field to start coming back and have and craft these curriculums because we work with complex projects and that's not how we are taught. So yes, on all accounts. I know Eve has a question. I want to make sure we get to that as well. Thank you. I saw your hand. Hi. <laughs> so you might have an answer. I'll to try to combine too. my answers or comments to both questions about how we should change the architectural curriculum and what it is we should be measuring in order to provide something to architects. So I'm trained both as a neurophysiologist and, a, oh, both, I used both. I'm trained as a neurophysiologist and a clinician and an architect. So I've immersed myself in all of these pedagogies. And um, I love your point, if we're going to build for people, let's understand people. And I make the point that let's go beyond psychology and cognitive neuroscience, let's go beyond the mind and the conscious to measure the subconscious, the sensory and perceptual, because those moments of measure are more aligned with what architects and designers need to build spaces. So how much light, how much sound, how much texture or color and the interesting thing there is, when you start doing that, then you end up with not a prescription and not a single measure or a single color, but a range and a range of responses that takes into account the fact that, you know, someone said to me, oh, I can't design for, you know, the few. I have to design for the 80%. I have to design for the ordinary person. Well, 90% of us are not 20-year-old Olympians. 90% of us are not the perfect specimens of humanity. So let's design for the clinical needs. Our visual range, our physical range, our different emotions and our different reactions. And let's add sensory physiology to cognitive neuroscience and behavior. And then those pieces become the pieces that we add together and say, not, re not purely reductionist, we have a holistic thought, we understand why a certain room makes people across all cultures and time, that it does, we understand that it does have an impact 
Why? Well, let's look at some of the pieces that do that and some of the pieces that stand in the way and as they relate to the different sensations and desires that David was talking about. And we do this in medicine. If we simply said we don't understand everything, it's a phenomenon, come back in 10 to 50 years and we'll see if we can help you with your diabetes. Um, why wait? We don't have to wait. We have some pieces. Let's begin with the pieces we have and cross train as we're doing here so that we can work together as a team while we are waiting to train together as professions. Um, Could so, you repeat the question? So the question was explaining how I define sensory physiology versus cognitive physiology. Great question. Uh, gray lines in between each one, but if I talk about sensory as the physical environment being changed by physiology into some neural reactions that actually are then perceived by the brain even at a very basic level, so even light, even sound is processed right out there at the sensory organs before it goes up to the higher levels in the brain and across to other levels to be reprocessed. And we don't sense any of that. It's below our conscious knowledge. Um, and yet sometimes we can train ourselves to become more sensitized to it. But often we talk about the cognitive as the conscious. And I think we want to make sure that we include the all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think, yeah. Uh, I'm very happy to follow Eve. I actually raised my hand to speak quite a long time ago, and I, I, I do want to address a point that uh, was raised uh, earlier um, by Jim Wise when he said, you know, there's nothing so practical as a good theory. Um, I'm thinking back uh, to the, f the foundation and formation of ANFA and John Eberhard, who I knew for a very long time before he became interested, I guess he, you know, he met some of the wonderful neuroscientists who work here uh, in, in the San Diego area and said, wow, we've got to figure out how we can bring these things to bear uh, in architecture. And John and I were interested for a very long time in how people are affected by the built environment. And John added the dimension of, said, all this behavioral stuff is great. We really want to understand, and we need the neuroscientists to help us, what's going on in the brain uh, that is generative and, and, and causing these processes. And I personally, and we're going to talk about it some tomorrow morning, I personally was very impacted and affected by the research uh, on circadian rhythms that's going to be presented tomorrow. And I work in a very narrow field within architecture of the, the justice arena. And again, I don't want to make the presentation from tomorrow, but I just want to say that I, f I find that my ability to talk to my non, very much non-science, scientifically trained clients and tell them that there is real neuroscience behind the effects that we're talking about, about natural light in correctional facilities, the fact that I can talk back to a theory and have some real understanding of what's going on in the brain uh, when, when, the, light, when the, uh, the retina is stimulated by light or not, and what kind of light and how much light and when in the day and the, and, and, and the spectrum and all that, that I can talk about those things really strengthens my ability to get them interested in what I'm talking about. And then they're also, they want to know about the health impacts, the impacts on stress, the impacts on irritability and, and conflict, because all those things matter very much in this, this uh, intensified environment of a correctional facility. So I really believe that, that we haven't been talking quite enough through parts of this conversation this afternoon about the underlying brain functions, and, and I'm an architect, so thank you. We have another question. I just want to follow up on that because that speaks to the value of what he's bringing to his clients. And I think a lot of the architects that are here in the room 
are looking for that because it's a huge responsibility to design a building and we want it to be helpful and healthy and all, all of the things that you described. So that's why we're here. So if you're asking the question what we need to measure, it's measure what matters to human beings. Not really a question, sorry. <laughs> Well, I'm sure we would have lots of statements if, you ask, if we asked you to make statements, but we're asking you to ask questions. So we have uh, a hand up over here. Oh, sorry, per we perhaps start back based, there and then. Perhaps based on that and what matters to humans, I'm curious as to, with so many variables in the built environment, I was thinking about the pop-up lab and the fact my head couldn't uh, keep from going to ceiling height, cathedral effect, to color theory in that space, to lack of view, to daylight, all the other variables that come into play that will impact an outcome. Um, and I'm curious how much each of you feels we can rely on the gradual slope of human evolution to help us create controls in our environments. Um, and it's a little bit of a leap, so maybe not the best scientific question, but I think of things like prospect and refuge and biophilia, which are 30 and 40 year old terms and hypotheses, but factor quite well with the, fa you know, the, the fact that we've been around for 2 million years, um, just 40,000 years ago is when we realized that we could work together as social creatures and that 99.987% of our life has been spent outside. And we wonder why people aren't happy when we sort of shoehorn them into buildings. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the sort of gradual slope that we as humans kind of continue to follow and how that can factor into these hypotheses. David, I'll look to you. That's Anybody such a good have any thoughts? <laughs> it, may, it may be a, a bit esoteric for the panel you have. Um, it, it's but such a... If yeah. anyone can answer, it's Upali. <laughs> I don't know the answer. I was going to add to the question <laughs> and then look to David to answer. I, I don't know. I, I think that's a really good question because uh, you also have the statistic that more information has been produced in the last five years than the entire history of mankind, right? So, like I said, something interesting is happening right now, which has huge implications that we really don't understand. So, I think it's a great question. I don't know if... Uh, if we are getting close to that, and I had never thought of it that way. The percentage of the time we spend indoors versus how much percentage of our evolution has been outdoors. Uh, uh, it's a really interesting way to look at it. Uh, I, I did want to take the opportunity to go back to Jay's question because I think that the power of neuroscience is that you usually have started with something very exploratory, then you've done environmental psychology, you've done experimental psychology, and, and then at the end of it, you're, you're able to really look in the brain. Um, and, and that gives you a lot of confidence in conversations with clients and be able to say, okay, this is where we are. Our field is where some conversations can happen at that level, and some conversations are not even at the exploratory level in all the variables that we design. So I think that's the piece that is tricky. That goes back to what you were saying, that some things are ready now for testing. Some things are ready to be tested neuroscientifically. And some questions haven't been framed, like the one you just raised. Um, and so we have to have comfort with where do we get deterministic, and where do we stay speculative and be able to traverse those two, to some extent. But I, I wonder if David has a question that I just hadn't thought about it, so thank you. Of course, I have an attitude. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, I, I'm an advocate of extended mind and distributed cognition. And certainly um, someone who is interested in cognitive prostheses. So um, what is this comment about evolution? Uh, by that I mean uh, we have been so tied into cultural accelerators that it's hard to determine what a human is. A human, is that the one with clothing or without? Is that the one that has medicine or without? So uh, these are just the superficial stuff. This is not the slope that's about to take off where um, 
uh, I go to conferences and, and, and they're about all the sensors you can pack into the body <laughs> as well as actuators. So yes, okay, it may take more than 30 years, maybe it won't, but certainly 50 years, and it depends on your attitude, what you think is going to happen about um, the gradual cyborgness of people, uh, how much is going to move in, but already people are carrying around all sorts of things that change their capacities in, in, in countless ways, and that happens in the cognitive capacities, and it happens in somatic capacities, and it happens in medical capacities, where you have artificial pancreas. Uh, so, you know, you're either an optimist or you're not. And um, <laughs> I, yeah, I am, and I think that uh, this will change pretty fast. All the environments will change pretty fast at low cost in the future. Yep. Energy will be free in 50 years. Does anyone not doubt that? How about college? <laughs> <laughs> did, did you see that the IVs are $6,000 if you can't afford it? Yeah, yeah right. I'm, I'm going to change. I'm asking a question here. I'm going to change the subject a little. We know that studying neuroscience and architecture and understanding how the built environment affects us, we know, hi Eduardo, can you see me? There we go. Okay. I see you. Right? Okay. okay. Uh, we, we know that, you know, people will pay for it to be implemented into hospitals and we can test it in hospitals and we can implement it into schools. But what about the home? Right, so Terry mentioned that in an ICU or in the hospital at night, you're poked and prodded, right? But what about the home? You're sleeping, you need to be safe, right? So we're, we're moving away from suburbia and coming back to urban life, right? And you can't, and we wanna have lead design and passive systems. Okay, so that means we're gonna have cross ventilation, open your windows, you're gonna have smog in, if you live in an urban setting, you're gonna have noises living in an urban setting. You're gonna have light when you live in an urban setting. How do we get these studies into the developers or into the architects for designing homes, designing apartments and condos in an urban setting? There was another question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Hannah was actually asking a question. But it was a nice statement. Uh, we have a question down here, or who's got the microphone? Ah, okay, thank you. Okay, sorry, question that didn't get answered. Um, I love this conference because it's a place where everyone in the audience is also an expert. Um, so thanks for that opportunity. Um, I do want to cut back to the conversation around architecture, the profession of architecture, licensure, and our social responsibility. Um, I reached out to this organization because um, a number of years ago, NCARB and NAAB actually reduced the requirements rather than increased them in regard to how much information and social sciences has to be part of the architectural curriculum. And I'm excited that the crux of this conversation is about the application and theory of science, both what we already know and have known for thousands of years and what we are yet to know. And so I'm hoping that the panelists can each share with us some of the nuggets or sharp pieces of information that we can use as professionals to make sure that there's greater respect for social science and um, cognitive research in our profession. So highlights of, of what you're each bringing to the table um, that we can take back to our profession and make it happen. I think uh, you're going to have to ask us individually tomorrow <laughs> because we're very much out of time mm -hmm. and um, we're not out of questions, we're just not hearing them, but um, I think that it's important <laughs> for us to interact with you. Uh, and we, we only can do it tomorrow because now we have to close this. But I wanted to point out that we are building for the privileged, like for example, the university across the road here. We're building um, a campus 
And yet we have problems. I mean, a, a campus for, for kids who are really bright and so on and so forth. And yet um, we are now trying to deal in the next set of buildings, which Rupali is involved in, with the fact that uh, we have an increasing number of students of concern. If you know what I'm talking about, it means that feel isolated, uh, that feel depressed, that have uh, mental issues. We think that 25% of the students coming in, all these really privileged kids, are, are going to have a difficult time. And so, you know, and I'm bringing this up because this is a situation in which you might say, but we already have so much knowledge. And nature, I mean, this is a campus that is very open. You know, there's lots of nature there. Um, and they, you know, we live in a place that is 70 degrees all year or whatever. I mean, this is a beautiful campus, a beautiful area and so on and so forth. And yet, and yet, we're dealing with problems that we should figure out how to fix. And, you know, <coughs> in part, what we're starting to talk about in this session is can we approach some of problems like that in ways that uh, might give us uh, insight into what is going on when these kids are not interacting with the space in a way that supports them. So part of the reason we had this discussion about measurement and what, the, and what does it mean is that we are not, we still don't know a lot about how we interact with space. And I think that the conversation between neuroscientists and architects, and I think it is actually a dialogue, it's not a monologue in one direction, is that we have different ways of thinking of, about our environment and how we interact with it. And architects, by asking questions, actually make us scientists think about things that normally we don't think about because we reduce the question to something we can answer. But the questions that are really interesting at this point, we cannot answer. So thank you, architects, for bringing some of these things up. In any case, um, we're out of time. <laughs>